Good afternoon and welcome to Comet Corner. This is a virtual series created by the UT Dallas Office of Research and Innovation in partnership with the schools across our campus to host chats with some of our notable alumni to hear how they have taken their research out into the world and made an impact. My name is Danny Lamb, Coordinator for Program Development and Outreach in the Office of Research and Innovation here at UT Dallas. Please post questions in the chat for our speakers at any time. Moderating our discussion today is Dr. Nils Romer. Dr. Nils Romer is the Interim Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities in the School of Arts, Technology, and Emerging Communications, the Director of the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies, and the Stan and Barbara Robin Distinguished Professor in Holocaust Studies at UT Dallas. He received his MA in 1993 from the University of Hamburg and in 2000 his PhD from Columbia University. He has published numerous articles, books, and several co-edited volumes and is also the co-editor of the Germanic Review. His special fields of interest are the Holocaust, human rights, and German and Jewish cultural and intellectual history, and he has been with UT Dallas since 2006. Dean Romer, welcome to Comic Corner. Thank you again for having me here. This is an exciting opportunity in particular since it gives me a chance to welcome actually one of our own back to campus almost, um, at least virtually. Scott is again uh, with us here today um, and we're really pleased to have him in particular since he kind of stayed close. Um, he's not too far. He's actually um, mostly in Frisco, I believe, teaching at Collin um, College. So let me introduce our very distinguished speaker. Scott spent quite a bit of time with us a couple of years ago and finished his PhD uh, in the history of ideas with a dissertation on the Holocaust in the Netherlands, where he tried to ponder numerous questions all at once, but in particular tried to understand the kind of unique circumstances of how the Holocaust actually unfolded within the context of the Dutch society, which allegedly early on opposed quite a bit of opposition to the Third Reich, but ultimately ended up being probably far more complicit than maybe other would have anticipated. So you're going to hear a lot about that later on, and I'm not going to take away from this. Um, but aside from that, he is also now a professor of history at Collin College, like I already said, a certified instructor with experience of teaching both American and world history. Prior to it, he has taught for many years at the Air Force Academy. He is proficient in numerous languages um, and talented in many. You can see his learned demeanor. He has a book, big bookshelf behind him loaded with good things. And so we're really excited to have you here, Scott. Dr. Schwarzfeger. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Dr. Romer. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, let me share my screen here and um, we can talk about um, the Netherlands. So uh, I had the opportunity to uh, to give this presentation uh, a little over a year ago um, to the, um, the Collin College community uh, in cooperation with uh, Yad Vashem with a, a, a Holocaust Day event that they had. Um, and I thought it would be an appropriate uh, topic for today too, especially uh, with some of the things that are going on in the world today. Um, so uh, we're talking about anti-Semitism, uh, specifically hate speech uh, leading to violence in the Netherlands. So I suppose the first question that I would, uh, would pose is why Amsterdam? And, and for me, that's an interesting road. I initially came to uh, UTD to the uh, Ackerman Center to do work on the Holocaust in the former Soviet Union. Uh, and when one of the first classes that I had with Dr. Romer, um, we I was wrote a paper on Amsterdam, uh, an urban history of Amsterdam, and I was sort of swept up in that. And there were some questions that I had that really turned my attention completely away from the Soviet Union. Um, and to the Netherlands and the, the Am Amsterdam and the Netherlands in general are unique uh, in a number of ways. So they're unique because they had an extremely well integrated Jewish population, uh, both Ashkenazim and Sephardim. Um, the Ashkenazim coming from Eastern Europe uh, and Russia, the Sephardim coming originally from Spain and Portugal. Uh, and they uh, immigrated in typically at about the 17th century, uh, both into Amsterdam. So they have very well integrated uh, Jewish population. 
Um, it was interesting in the history of the Holocaust in that it's the only city to have a well-organized college protest, a number of college protests against anti-Jewish measures, uh, both at the University of Amsterdam and the University of Leiden. Uh, there were large-scale labor strikes uh, to protest these anti-Jewish uh, measures. Uh, the February strike of 1941 uh, lasted for about three days. Over 300,000 people participated in that. It essentially shut down Amsterdam. It was, of course, crushed by uh, the Nazi regime, but it stands as a testimony uh, to the solidarity that the Dutch people felt to their Jewish neighbors, uh, at least in the beginning. The, uh, uh, the Netherlands, the Amsterdam, had a civilian rather than a military administration. This was fairly rare um, as well, and we'll look at that in just a few minutes. It did not have a Jewish ghetto. There's a story behind that too. We'll uh, we'll kind of uh, answer that question in a few minutes as well. But typically, uh, the cities of Europe, uh, the, the Jewish communities were were crammed into uh, a central part of town, um, and this part was walled off, um, and they were essentially um, held there until they could be transported uh, to uh, killing centers or to. Uh, concentration camps. Uh, the Netherlands didn't have that. Amsterdam specifically um, did not have, have that. And Amsterdam had uh, consistent leadership in its Jewish council. A Jewish council or a Judenrat uh, was also very common. It was uh, something that the uh, Nazi authority set up as sort of an inter intermediary between the Jewish community and their leadership. Uh, it, it placed the members of the Jewish councils uh, in a particularly uncomfortable uh, situation because they had to uh, cooperate to a degree uh, with their uh, with their perpetrators. And um, so uh, the, the leadership in these Jewish councils typically didn't last for very long. This is not true uh, of, uh, of Amsterdam. So we'll look at that too in uh, just a moment. Uh, and then the most telling difference, the one thing that really caught my attention right off the bat, is the number of uh, uh, Jews who lost their lives uh, in the Holocaust. So uh, the Le Netherlands, uh, that number is 75% um, compared to 40 to 45% in Belgium and 25% uh, in France. So a significantly larger number of uh, Jewish citizens in um, the Netherlands lost their lives in the Holocaust. So the big question there is why? Um, so again, Amsterdam specifically is an intersection uh, between these Sephardic and uh, Ashkenazi cultures. Uh, my dissertation uh, that I wrote is really a cultural history. It really talks a lot about um, these two cultures coming together, merging, uh, creating a community. Uh, they had differences, um, but at their core uh, was a, a shared culture um, of, uh, of Judaism. And th there was a Jewish, a Jewish quarter in Amsterdam, they sort of, you know, set up by themselves, um, and it's made famous by Rembrandt. Rembrandt, of course, von der Rhein, uh, lived in this Jewish quarter, um, and it, it captured his imagination as well, and much of his art is about uh, the people who lived here um, and the colorful Jewish quarter. It, it's, it's really captured the imagination of quite a few artists, and I just have a few examples of this. We'll go through these pretty quickly, um, but this is uh, Max Lieberman, and um, his uh, his painting of the Jewish Quarter, um, where he kind of captures its color, its vibrancy. Um, there was a lot of commerce there. People from really all over Amsterdam would come uh, to buy produce, to buy uh, pickles, to buy herring, to buy a number of things uh, that were for sale in this uh, Jewish Quarter. Franz de Groot uh, has a slightly different um, vision of the uh, Jewish quarter, really showing some of the poverty uh, that existed there. Um, the Ashkenazim uh, specifically kind of settled into a, a culture of poverty in Amsterdam uh, in parts of this uh, Jewish quarter. And then these are photographs from the 1920s and 1930s that also illustrate that kind of poverty uh, in the Jewish quarters. The Jewish uh, population in Amsterdam was much larger than it was in most uh, other European cities as well. So if we're talking about anti-Semitism, we're talking about how this changes. You know, we mentioned uh, the solidarity that, that non-Jews in Amsterdam, the, 
um, felt towards their Jewish neighbors, and then this sort of changes. Um, and so to look at that, I think we need to really kind of do a very, very brief um, review of anti-Semitism uh, leading to violence um, in Germany. And of course, it comes to a head in 1932 uh, with the presidential election, uh, Paul von Hindenburg running against uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, Hindenburg wins. He wins the second seven-year term um, as president, but he's convinced uh, by his son, Oscar, to um, nominate Hitler as his chancellor. Uh, Hindenburg then dies. He's already in, well into his 80s. Um, and uh, Hitler combines the office of chancellor and president and uh, becomes der Führer. Um, and the uh, Nazi party, then the National Socialists, um, cement their power and authority in Germany and immediately launch a campaign of propaganda um, against the Jews. And uh, where they frame the Jews as really the international enemy, right? This idea of, of Zionism, uh, the, the protocols of the elders of Zion, um, this idea that Jewish communities throughout the world had been for centuries plotting the overthrow of non-Jews. Um, and so you see by this uh, propaganda poster, for example, you know, behind, behind the enemy, behind every enemy um, is the Jew. And uh, the, with the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, it essentially took away the citizenship of uh, German Jews, did a number of things, but essentially made them non-citizens. Uh, and then with the violence of Kristallnacht in 1938, where uh, groups of, um, of uh, Germans um, sponsored by the SS went and smashed the windows of Jewish businesses all over Germany and then charged them uh, with the repair of those windows. Um, and with that, a number of them were rounded up and sent to sort of the early concentration camps. And a number of them also simply took this note and fled the country, many of them coming into the Netherlands. And it's at this point when Amsterdam sets up a receiving center um, in Westerbork um, to bring in these refugees uh, from Germany after Kristallnacht. Uh, then, of course, uh, World War II started with the German invasion of Poland in September of 1939. And by 1940, uh, the German Blitzkrieg had worked so effectively in Europe and they uh, they defeated the Netherlands, the, the defensive forces of the Netherlands, in about five days um, and took over in Amsterdam. And with that, they put in place an administrative apparatus. And I mentioned earlier that this was different from uh, most cities in uh, Europe and that they did not put uh, a military um, administrative apparatus, but rather a civilian one. They brought in Arthur Seyss Inkvat, who had uh, briefly been the chancellor of Austria before the Anschluss, before Germany merged with Austria. Um, and they made him the Reichskommissar uh, of, um, of Amsterdam, of the, of the Netherlands. Uh, and they put German general commissioners, one of finance, one of justice, um, one of the higher police, um, the police commissioner in higher SS, and uh, then one of party and special affairs. So it is Hans Rauta, uh, the, um, the uh, higher SS, who's really kind of the, uh, the important person for us to talk about today. Um, in addition to that, uh, the Germans took over a very efficient Dutch bureaucracy led by Karl Fredericks, the undersecretary of the Dutch civil service. He's the highest ranking civil servant in the Netherlands at this uh, at this time, and Frederick stays in place, and Fredericks really sees it as um, his job to essentially represent the government, the Dutch government in exile, by cooperating uh, with the um, uh, with the Germans and this administrative apparatus that they that they put into place. Um, Fredericks is uh, is really more concerned about the Dutch Nazis, um, the NSB than he is uh, about the German authorities uh, and, and, and thinks that it's in the best interest of the Dutch to be as efficient as possible. This becomes important for us as we start seeing some of these Jewish exclusions in, in Amsterdam. Um, so we essentially now set back the clock in Amsterdam to Germany in 1933 and see the same kind of exclusions. But something interesting about Amsterdam uh, is right off the bat, they have all of the citizens of Amsterdam fill out an Aryan attestation form 
Uh, form A was for Aryans, form B was in for non-Aryans and it was in triplicate. Um, and you essentially register as a Jew. And it is these records that allow the uh, Germans to more efficiently and effectively round up the Jews of Amsterdam um, when that time comes. And the real question that has been asked about this is why did they cooperate? Why did they just not fill out this form? Um, and the answer to that is they had been living cooperatively with the Dutch um, already for centuries. And the Dutch already knew who they were. And uh, to disobey an order like filling out this form could have disastrous consequences um, for them. Um, so almost to the person, uh, they filled out this form honestly, um, which then the Dutch bureaucracy was able to use um, later on. Now, I'm going to go quickly through these uh, because, again, this is essentially the clock bet set back to Germany in the 1930s uh, with revocation of citizenship, um, uh, essentially prohibitions of uh, attending any sort of sporting events or participating in any sort of public life, exclusions from restaurants, theaters, public transportation, firing of Jewish teachers, expulsion of Jewish students, prohib prohibition of uh, mixed marriages. Uh, this is all exactly in the Nazi playbook. As long as, as uh, along with the confiscation of Jewish businesses, bank accounts, um, the theft of Jewish museums and collections, jewelry, uh, radios. I, I'm brought to this quote by Jakob Pressa. He was a, a victim of um, the, uh, the Holocaust in the Netherlands. Uh, and he wrote a really comprehensive book about this called Ashes in the Wind. And he says, it's a well-known fact that they, the Nazis, joined hatred of Jews to an intense love of Jewish possessions, a love shared by Nazis, great and small, believers and free thinkers, illiterates and intellectuals um, alike. So it is at this point where we kind of see the world's most liberal city learning to hate. Um, and we see over the next few years, the Dutch kind of turning on their, their Jewish neighbors who they had so recently defended. And so the Dutch Nazi party was already in place. This is Anton Musert's uh, Dutch Nazi party. Um, and the German NSDAP, the German Nazis, didn't ever really give them a lot of credibility. They didn't really trust the Dutch Nazi party. They, they, they felt them to be, uh, to be fifth columnists uh, and not a serious organization. Uh, but after the occupation, a Dutch union was formed, uh, which really did have a lot more credibility and a lot more power from the uh, German NSDAP and, and kind of functioned in a way almost like the Vichy government in uh, France. In addition, uh, the Verhaftelung or the VA uh, forms after the occupation as well. And this Verhaftelung were uh, armed, uh, sort of a, almost a paramilitary branch of the NSB, of the Dutch Nazi party. And then there was also the Ordnungspolizei, uh, known as the Green Police because of their uniforms. And they also did the bidding of Hans Raude, the higher SS. Uh, there in Amsterdam. And then, of course, in addition to uh, this, we have the German SS and the, the German Schutzstaffe and the German Gestapo um, as well. So this Verhaftelung, this WA, uh, they took to uh, ransacking the Jewish quarter and kind of traveled around in gangs, essentially, in groups, um, and would beat up and rape and steal from and essentially victimize the Jewish uh, citizens of Amsterdam, particularly in the Jewish quarter. And this led inevitably to a resistance of sorts. Uh, and it's several of them actually, but the one I'll focus on right now, because it has kind of a cascading effect here, uh, is what's known as the Kut incident. So there are a group of young Jewish men. Um, many of them had been boxers. It's kind of an, an odd and interesting thing that uh, boxing was a big part of Jewish culture in the Netherlands. Um, you see on your screen here uh, the famous uh, Ben Brill, uh, who, uh, who, who participated in the 1928 Olympics. He's a flyweight boxer. Um, so there's a big boxing culture and gymnastics culture, really athletic culture in general, um, among the Dutch Jews. Um, so after the occupation, after they are denied, they, you know, all of these boxing clubs had to break up. They couldn't have any sporting events of any kind. They form uh, what, they, what they call the uh, Knochplucha. 
uh, and the Kanach Pluka, we, we translate that as action groups, but it really is more accurately translated um, as vigilantes, um, and they formed a uh, resistance unit, um, and they they saw themselves as protectors, um, and so there was an event where a group of the WA uh, were coming into the Jewish quarter, and they were starting to harass someone. Uh, the Kanach Pluka, members of the Kanach Pluka were nearby. Um, there was a fight. Um, the Kanach Pluka were much better fighters because they were, you know, they were boxers, and um, they beat up and run off this um, th this group of WA members. But this results uh, in the death of one of those members. He falls and hits his head, um, and that is Hendrik Kut. Uh, so this then is framed as Jewish aggression, and it's framed as a terrorist attack against the peaceful law-keeping uh, forces of the uh, Netherlands against the vicious uh, vis vicious Jewish vigilantes. And they traced the Knochplucha back to an ice cream parlor in South An Amsterdam owned by Ernst Kahn and Alfred Kohn. Um, and so uh, the SS and the um, NSB raid this ice cream parlor and uh, they they basically murder everyone there. Khan and Cohn escape but are later rounded up um, and executed. And the uh, Germans use this as an excuse then, uh, particularly with uh, Hans Rauter um, and a man named Bunker, who was uh, Zeis Inkwart's uh, commissioner there in of anti-Jewish affairs, essentially, in, uh, in Amsterdam. And Bunker and Rauter then take this opportunity to fence off the ghetto. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry, to fence off the uh, Jewish quarter and make it into a Jewish ghetto. Um, they then have a razia or roundup uh, of Jewish people just literally off the streets, literally out of their homes. Um, they bring them to uh, Yo uh, to uh, um, Jonas Daniel Mayaplein. In February of 1941, um, and many of them were then shipped off to Mauthausen, uh, where they were, where all of them were killed. Um, so this is also an opportunity for the uh, German and Dutch authorities to form a Jewish council, um, Yodschadad, uh, and this is a photograph of that Jewish council, and uh, the diamond businessman. Um, uh, Abraham Asher, you can see him on the seated on the very far left, um, and Dr. David Cohen, a professor at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and then and Asher and Cohen basically f are the presidents of this Yod Shorad, and the presidents from the from the moment that it forms until they themselves um, are um, uh, are sent to Treysienstad in 1943. They're responsible for a number of things. They're responsible to communicate with the uh, German and Dutch authorities, but they're also responsible for communicating with uh, the Jewish population. They do that by kind of consolidating all the previous Jewish newspapers into one at Jodschewik Blad. So it is a, uh, a, a weekly um, newspaper specifically to the Dutch Jews, specifically to um, those in, in, in Amsterdam, and they um, they then uh, are able to communicate the will of the um, uh, of the Germans to the Jewish people. Um, now, this is a really difficult issue because we could spend an hour or more just talking about the Jewish Council. Um, they have uh, been accused of collaboration, um, and this is a very fine line, of course. Uh, because they have to do their jobs as it's seen by the Jew by the uh, German authority while not flat out betraying their own people. Um, and they're responsible for everything. They took over the running of all of the Jewish um, uh, all of the Jewish uh, charities. Uh, they delivered the mail. They were responsible for the hospital. They were responsible really for everything. Um, but it ultimately, I believe that the uh, the Jewish Council prom Council promoted a false sense of normalcy um, that delayed escape or evasion uh, for many until um, it was too late. So, with this identification of Jews comes the you know the the the, the famous Jewish ID card. Uh, those who were members of the uh, Jewish Council, the Yotzerad, 
were given um, uh, exemptions. Uh, so you can see here in the lower left hand corner, um, this is an, a, 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 a Jewish council identification uh, showing that this woman is not to be deported uh, because she has some protections as members of uh, the Jewish council, but pretty much everyone else uh, was given an ID card uh, with a, uh, a J for Yod. Um, this is uh, this is Simon Cowan. I, I, I included his picture on here because um, it's an interesting story of obedience. Uh, it's an interesting story in general. Simon Cowan was a, uh, a young Jewish uh, boy, about 16 years old. He was active in everything, active in sports, active in music, um, and he uh, he went with his father to get their ID cards. Now, Simon just happened to be uh, blonde and happened to have what the um, official, the Dutch official, uh, turned as a Christian looking face. And this Dutch official gave Simon the opportunity, the option of getting an ID card without the J because he felt like he could pretty much hide in plain sight. Uh, Simon's father uh, refused. Uh, they were Jewish. They were going to identify as Jewish. They were going to obey the rules. Now, obviously, Simon's father did not have a crystal ball. And they. this is a, this is another, this is a great example of how none of the people living in Amsterdam really could comprehend, including those who were on the Jewish council, who really had evidence to the contrary. They couldn't comprehend something as nefarious as the Holocaust, something as nefarious as the rounding up of every Jewish person in the Netherlands and sending them to their deaths. Um, and so Simon got uh, the correct um, ID card with a J. He was that summer sent to a work camp. He was excited about this. He got a new photograph taken uh, for his new employers um, and he left for the train station with his guitar in hand, um, ready for an adventure, ready for a uh, summer of work, um, put a little bit of mileage on his soul, as they say. Um, and he, of course, boarded the train that took him to um, Auschwitz. And he never even registered there. It's presumed that he was killed uh, before he was even able to register. So this is a this is a this is a terrible, tragic story, of course. But it shows us just how little the Dutch citizens knew or imagined of what. Uh, was in store for them. So, of course, this is the com the, the compulsory wear of the Star of David. Uh, this si uh, sign in German says that wer dieses uh, Zeichen trägt ist ein Fiend unserer Volkes, right? Whoever wears this sign is an enemy of the people. Um, at that point in 1942, uh, they start uh, deporting people to work camps as they had deported uh, Simon. And uh, this is another um, eyewitness account. Uh, it's a primary source for us um, from Jakob Pressa describing a scene that uh, he witnessed uh, in one of these roundups and just um, the extent to which the Germans and now many of the Dutch viewed the Jews as being somehow subhuman. I'm trying to keep my eye on the clock so I can see where we're at. And the Jewish um, council then also uh, was somewhat complicit in this as well, in terms of uh, informing the citizens of Amsterdam that they were to obey with these summons when they were told uh, to to meet at a certain place uh, to go off to uh, labor camps. Um, these roundups then started taking place in the large Jewish theater, the Schauberg Theater, which really up to that point up to the 19, 1942, 1943, was still operating as a theater. They were still having orchestra performance. They were still having plays. Uh, life was going on as normal. And again, this, this sense of normalcy, um, I think, betrayed a number of Dutch Jews. Uh, but by 19, by September of 1943, um, all of the, the Jews of Amsterdam had either been rounded up and sent through Westerbork, um, to uh, Mauthausen or Tresienstad or Auschwitz, um, or they had gone into hiding. Um, at this point, many of them had uh, gone into uh, hiding. Um, so again, I think this is a very telling quote from Jacques Meyer um, from the Vanished Ghetto. If all that we saw had any meaning, it was this. All the generations of Jews have lived in vain unless we recover their path, which in times of joy and of sorrow, they never forgot. Following their tracks will indeed be difficult, 
because we will never, never be able to forget this Amsterdam. So I'll just I'll close with a few photographs here from Emmy Andrese. Emmy Andrese was a Jewish Dutch woman living in Amsterdam who chose to hide in plain sight. She posed as a non-Jew and, uh, and got away with it. And she was a photographer, a particularly gifted photographer, and she developed ways to hide her camera and take pictures of, uh, of, of Amsterdam, uh, particularly in that very last year of the occupation uh, in which they had no food. It was known uh, as the hunger winter and pretty much everyone was, uh, was starving. So I'll leave you with a few of these uh, fantastic photos by Emmy Andrize of uh, war-torn Amsterdam. And then the celebration that took place uh, when the Germans were uh, defeated. And then finally, some a few of the primary and secondary sources that I used um, for this presentation. All right. All right. Thank you, Scott. That was um, quite a bit that you packed into those few minutes um, in order for us to make um, understand a little bit about the complexities really of this period and how the Holocaust in lots of ways comes to the Netherlands and how it really unfolds. Um, let me just return maybe to um, the, the point that you made, you know, toward the end again, and, and then at some point in the middle, that was in many ways the what you call the, the normality of, of daily life. That in lots of ways, I think you just said the normality betrayed the Dutch Jews and used several examples. So it's the very quote unquote benign manifestations of daily life then that in many ways um, seem to have, you know, made it less feasible for the Jews to anticipate the worst. How about Vesterbrook itself and all this? Which role, I mean, after all, they were not deported straight from Amsterdam to Auschwitz, but most of them were at first deported to a familiar place, Vesterbrook. Would you see that as part of the kind of creating an illusion that after all, they were just sent to a nearby camp? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, there was a lot of things that went into this uh, illusion of normalcy. Part of it was how uh, assimilated they had been already, how integrated they were into Dutch society. They were themselves Dutch in every respect. Um, and there was a belief that they, uh, being Dutch, being so well integrated in society, that they would escape the fate that maybe was had fallen upon German Jews. Um, and so this belief was... Um, I think supported, maybe inadvertently, was supported by the Jewish Council, um, particularly through the, um, the, the, the newspaper. Um, and uh, you mentioned Vesterbork. So Vesterbork was actually created uh, by a, a, the Jewish, a, a committee for Jewish refugees, uh, in which um, David Cohen actually was part of this um, committee. And there were so many immigrants flooding from Germany into the Netherlands, where they believed they would be safe if the worst happened. Um, and uh, so really throughout the 1930s, but as I mentioned, uh, particularly after Kristallnacht, this was set up as a, a transit center for the Jewish people, right? So they were taken through Vesterbork um, and they were sort of processed by this committee for Jewish refugees. And they were sent on then uh, to other places in Europe, or they were settled in Amsterdam, typically those that had means uh, and had uh, contacts, uh, were invited to stay in Amsterdam. Uh, many others were escorted through the Netherlands and into um, other places in Europe. But it was a place that was set up specifically for them. So there was a belief, I think, as they're processing them. So that uh, when this actual deportation, when the actual deportations began, um, and the Germans go, I mean, really prior to 1942, it's sort of a haphazard occupation and sort of a haphazard exclusion from society. But after 1942, the Germans in Amsterdam get more of a laser focus. Um, they get their marching orders from Himmler and they really know what they're doing. And at that point, they build up Vesterborg. They add dormitories. They make it a larger transit facility. And they used what had been there to support the Jewish community as a way to um, deport them to their uh, to their deaths. So yes, I think 
um, I mean, if you look at the writings of um, uh, Elie Hilesium, um, uh, letters from Vesterbork, I think um, you really see that there was this idea that it was going to be simply a labor camp. It was what the, the, the young boy that I illustrated, Simon Cowan, uh, what he believed. He was going to you know, work for a summer and everything was going to be fine. That's the worst case scenario is that they would labor for the Germans throughout the war and then they would be liberated by the Allies. Um, so, yes, I, I think it's a great observation. Uh, Vesterbork was definitely uh, something that they would not have feared, at least not initially. Thank you, Scott. Wonderful answer. I mean, there's obviously also sometimes the, the simple question, you know, considering that we deem often the Holocaust as something unprecedented and unparalleled, could anybody could have imagined actually what was going to happen or was there when not almost bound to 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 kind of see it within the context of what they had experienced, labor camps, summer camps, work camps, doing war or something like that. So I find that really an interesting part of your presentation, but it's now my great pleasure to introduce yet another one of our own and another uh, product of brilliance of our wonderful School of Arts and Humanities. Also one of recent PhDs, you guys are within two years or three years, I think, very close upon each other. Dr. Pedro Gonzalez Corona, who is an assistant professor of instruction in the School of Arts and Humanities and the assistant to the director, meaning to me, the Ackerman Center. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you now, Dr. Gonzalez, and um, you'll now have um, a little bit of a chance to respond to Dr. Schwarzweger's presentation and then we'll be in a conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Romer, uh, Dr. Uh, Schwarzweger. It's, it's great to see you, uh, and I thank you for this great presentation. Uh, as you were talking, I was uh, uh, thinking about a case, uh, a very tragic case, that uh, an event that happened in 1994 in Argentina. They had a, a bombing in one of the buildings uh, that belonged to one of the oldest uh, Jewish uh, organizations. And uh, w after the tragedy, the president went out and did two, two very um, unusual things. One, she, he talked about uh, Jewish victims and then innocent victims of the bombing. And the second is that he sent his condolences to Israel. And, and I was thinking about that uh, because at the beginning of your presentation, you did mention that uh, uh, Jewish people in Amsterdam were uh, extremely well integrated. So in the case of Argentina, we see that even though Jewish people were, I mean, citizens of Argentina, generations and generations, they are not considered to be part of the community, right? So that said, uh, and, and for the audience, uh, 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 I, I think I, um, I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on the difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazi uh, 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 cultures. And then what does it mean to say that they were extremely integrated? Uh, uh, how, how did that work? Because then we see a transition into violence. Yeah, that's a that, that's a great question. So um, the Sephardim, um, that's a, a term that uh, it essentially means Spanish. Um, so these are this is the the, the rich tradition of uh, Jewish communities in Spain and uh, in in Portugal um, after uh, the exclusion of uh, of the Moors. Um, you know, of course, when uh, during the Reconquista, uh, when Ferdinand and Isabella unite um, Spain and they expel the uh, Islamic Moors, they also expel Jews at the same time around the early 1490s. Um, and many of these um, these Jews end up migrating north, um, and they 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 end up in uh, the the 16th and 17th centuries um, in Amsterdam. And at the same time, many of the Ashkenazi, which is a, 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 typically a, it's a word that means German, um, but these were these were Jews that were living in the uh, Pale of Settlement in large part um, in that area between uh, the area of Eastern Europe, let's just say, 
they also immigrate to the Netherlands. And I, I, I believe um, that they were drawn there by this really early, unique um, liberalism of Amsterdam, right? Amsterdam um, was very different from every other community in Amsterdam. The Netherlands at this point had just won their independence from Spain. Um, they had just, this, the, the seven northern provinces um, had just become a Protestant um, uh, nation. Uh, and they had a, a specific, a, a particular amount of tolerance uh, that I think this tolerance was, you know, became very well known. And I think it is this tolerance that acted almost as a beacon to these uh, Ashkenazi and uh, Sephardic uh, communities. So the Sephardim came and they already were, had been successful in business. They already were, uh, had a, a rich tradition of scholarship and they took their place in Amsterdam specifically in the, uh, in, in, among the, in, uh, the intellectuals and among the uh, businessmen. And then by, you know, by the 18th century, uh, we're really running much of the diamond trade. Um, so they became, so we talk about integration then, um, you know, they looked Dutch, uh, they spoke perfect Dutch, they dressed Dutch, uh, they were in charge of uh, Dutch corporations, they ran Dutch businesses, um, they were Dutch in every respect, except that uh, they went to synagogue, right, rather than to uh, church. Um, and so the uh, many of the Ashkenazim, on the other hand, uh, were much more traditional. Uh, you know, think uh, Fiddler on the Roof, Village of Anatevka, right? Much more traditional in their dress, much more traditional in their culture. They came and continued that tradition. So they looked different. They never really fully, um, I guess, assimilated, for lack of a better word. I wish there was a better word. That's not, the word sounds a little harsh, but um, assimilated into Dutch, Dutch culture the way that the, Sef the Sephardim had. Um, but overall, um, it didn't really matter, right? So it was a, this was a distinction that mattered to the Dutch, and it was a distinction that mattered to the to the Jews themselves. But when the Germans came, they just saw them as all being one thing, right? To the Germans, it's not about culture. The, I mean, to the Nazis, I need to say, it was not about culture. Uh, it wasn't to them. Everything was about race and blood. So they could only see Jews through the lens of race. So to them, it was all the same, and they were all lumped together. Um, and even, uh, you know, I, uh, um, I mentioned uh, Hans Raude, um and uh, he, he worked a lot with um, uh, Abraham Asher, um, the, uh, one of the presidents of the, um, uh, of the uh, Jewish um, council, uh, and he only ever referred to him as that merchant Asher, but he wouldn't even use his name. Uh, so... Um, so I, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I, that's what I mean when I talk about integration and assimilation. Um, and the fact that because the Jewish council was made up of these people who, I mean, there were, there were no laborers, there were no butchers, there were no merchants uh, on the Jewish council. They were all people from sort of the upper echelon of society. They were all people that had means and had uh, and owned businesses uh, or were college professors or uh, were well respected in the in the Dutch community, um, and so this is, I think, kind of where they get this idea that they're going to be the exception. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, it, it does answer my question, and it leads me to the uh, to the uh, following comment regarding uh, race. I think it's very important to to talk about race. Is that idea that makes most people. Uh, catalog other people, assign uh, value, a certain human value. Uh, and uh, you, you did mention in your presentation the case of uh, Simon uh, Cowan. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in just a few uh, a seconds ago, you, you did mention this uh, Nazi idea about uh, blood in soil. So uh, do you mind uh, uh, telling us more about those two ideas. One that is really strict and rigid that encompass uh, this other idea of the perfect Aryan and everything that is not Aryan, that, that, that doesn't fit in that world. And then again, those who are outside, 
and may qualify such as Simon, right? I mean, th in that case, it's not so much about that uh, metaphysics or that essence carried only by the few, but in this case, it's about appearance, right? He was able to pass by Christian. Mm -hmm. Were there uh, uh, specific differences between the uh, perception of race in Amsterdam, let's say in, I don't know, Berlin or, or some other city, uh, uh, in which uh, Nazi ideas were uh, predominant? Yeah, that's well, that's, a, that's a deep question. I, I think, um, you know, I talk to my students sometimes about nationalism um, and what exactly that means. You know, there's the nationalism that says, hey, we are this people group, right? We, we have a unique language, we have a unique heritage, we have a unique culture, uh, we have a unique kind of food that we eat. We have a unique kind of music that we listen to. Uh, we have a unique flag. Uh, we're proud to be this pre this people, right? That's one kind of nationalism. And But the other kind of nationalism is when that goes off the rails, of course. And it becomes, not only are we distinct and unique, but we're better than everyone else. And, and, the, and the Germans had deluded themselves. The Nazis had deluded themselves. Uh, into believing that they were genetically superior to everyone around them. They were the descendants of this mythological uh, uh, people known as the Aryans, which of course that they completely, the real Aryans were, were people who brought Sanskrit down into India, of course, right? Uh, so it had nothing to do with the Germans. Um, but they, 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 they believed that they, um, that they were actually superior to their neighbors, which gave them the right to uh, to employ their ideas of Lebensraum, you know, living space, and so um, to the the Jews, to the to the Dutch Jews, it was all about culture, right? It really wasn't about how you looked. It really wasn't about uh, what your race was. It was about culture. So for Simon, you know, for his dad's point was, it doesn't matter what how Simon looks. Um, he's Jewish. He's culturally Jewish, right? So we're gonna we're gonna do the right thing. We're gonna be honest, right? We're gonna get an ID card with a J on it. Um, and to the the um, the administrator who was trying who was passing out the um, uh, the uh, ID cards felt like he was saving Simon's life, and probably actually would have H had he just you know uh, opposed as because he had blonde hair, which is uh, somewhat unique for Jewish people i suppose but um so what's interesting though uh, about that when the germans do come over and take over and they start their uh, uh, their administrative process of segregating the jews they at the very first thing they define jewishness right so jewishness for them in the netherlands uh, was one jewish grandparent who uh, participated in jewish culture who participated in jewish life and that's a, that's a kind of an interesting distinction. It's an interesting difference because typically it didn't really matter. Culture meant nothing, as I said. Culture meant nothing to the Nazis. You were Jewish by race or you were not. And if you were, you were guilty. And so um, whether or not you participate, I mean, you could, you could be second or third generation Christians in Germany, but if your family was Jewish at one point, you were still Jewish. You were guilty of being of uh, that that particular race as they saw it. So it, it's 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 interesting to me that they kind of mesh these two things when they go into Amsterdam. So they make uh, they actually assign a kind of a cultural culpability uh, initially, at least they fall back on their old ways and just go, go to be pretty much anybody in your family has ever been Jewish, you're Jewish. But initially they assign sort of a cultural cap culpability there. So if you had a, a, a Jewish, um, uh, grandparent who, uh, was not part of the Jewish community in any way, shape or form, you were okay, at least to start off with. Thank you so much. I'm um, taking a look at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the clock and, and we have 10 rich minutes. So I was going to precisely uh, ask uh, Dean Roman if he had any other questions or comments. Let me just uh, maybe just the other thing which you emphasized, and I think it ties it back into this question of uh, how well they were integrated and then how 
how you know many of them actually died. And that is a question of time. So in many ways, and you, you said it in your presentation, we have to remember that whatever happened in Nazi Germany really unfolded from 33 until 39. So, you know, a very gradual process of sorts. Whereas in the Netherlands, it came almost, you know, instantaneously. The Netherlands were occupied in 1940. And then before the, the Nazis started actually deporting anyone, they segregated the Jews. And so in lots of ways, they really engineered the Jews as being separate from the rest. In, in separate in steps leading up to the eventual deportation. And I think therefore the Jews that ultimately are being deported are not the Jews that lived in, you know, in, the, in the same manner in Amsterdam in 35 or 38. Their respective spaces had been already uh, redefined by the Nazis in a, in a very quick and very decisive manner. Would you agree with that characterization, Scott? Yeah, I would absolutely. And I think a lot of the Germans who immigrated to the Netherlands believed it would be safe. It would be neutral. Yeah. They had traditionally were neutral and they had every plan to be neutral. But of course, the Germans changed that plan um, very quickly. And so, yeah, um, I, I would agree with that. Absolutely. So that's maybe, you know, you started out with this question of how do we get from hate to violence? And so then one is always left with this you know, sense, well, how is anti-Semitism as a kind of form of hatred then ultimately responsible for not just hate, but really for physical violence and then ultimately for mass killing, right? And I think one step in between is really that, you know, from the perspective of the Third Reich, they engineered really a new reality. They isolated the, the Jews from the rest of their surrounding societies. They did that first very effectively in Germany, and then they did it very quickly and decisively in the countries that they ended up occupying, like the Netherlands or even earlier the Dutch. So how do you get from hate to violence? I think there's a step in between that is the kind of engineering of a new reality that makes what turns one's neighbor into a foreigner or into someone with whom one does not have any form of social interaction any longer. Yeah, I know I totally agree. And, I, and you mentioned the uh, the idea of pacing um, and uh, th they uh, I read a number of um, survivor accounts. One of them was from a woman named Yehudit uh, Ondemeyer, and uh, she talked about how initially they sort of left them alone. Initially, when the Germans uh, invaded, uh, set up their civil administration, uh, worked in concert with the Dutch uh, bureaucracy, um, they kind of left the Jewish communities alone. And um, for long enough, I mean, in the big picture of things, you're right, for it's not like the difference between 1933 and 1939, but they left them alone long enough to kind of give them this sense of, you know, maybe things are going to be different here. Maybe we, maybe we are different to them because we're Dutch uh, and because we're so much like them, right? Um, in, in, in every, you know, obvious way that you can see from, from the outside. Uh, but then, once these, um, once the exclusions started, uh, the Dutch uh, citizens who were not Jewish pushed back to such a large degree through both the universities and through this labor strike, pushed back to such a large degree that it caused the Germans to kind of pull back also and say, okay, maybe we're not ready for this. But within one year, they start up the exact same things. They, they, they you know, they, 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 they let it go for a little while. In about a year, they start the exact same thing. And in just one year, um, they initiate the same exclusions and the same, um, uh, and they, they start, you know, actually rounding up Jews. And now uh, in just one year, nobody really says anything. No one protests, uh, no one pushes back. Um, in just that year, they had either been cowed into submission or had been, you know, that's sort of that intermediary step that you're talking about, right? Where it takes them that long, uh, maybe the propaganda machine catches up by that point and people start saying, well, you know, I don't know, maybe they're right. So it's it's interesting that, um, uh, that what was completely outrageous and uh, caused the citizens of, of Amsterdam to be up in arms one year uh, is completely fine and acceptable the next year. 
No, very true. I think uh, let's it's uh, we are what five to one. So just let's make sure that we take one more big look around into the. Uh, well, not into the room, but um, into the chat room anyway, and see if there are any questions. Otherwise, I think we want to just give everyone a chance, obviously, to applaud you, Scott. This was a wonderful presentation and to thank you again. This was the rescheduled one. Um, but it's good all the same. Um, so we really appreciate you being with us today and also want to thank again Dr. Uh, Pedro Gonzalez Corona for his participation and of course our wonderful producer Danny Lamb and, and her whole team who has been doing this now for what two and a half years or how long have you been doing this? Um, yeah, and about that come pandemic. So pandemic. But some things that we started doing in the pandemic are that good that we may want to continue them. And this is certainly one of them that we've been all enjoying very much. Gives us also a chance really to bring back some of our older friends and former students like we did today. So I think this is certainly one to take forward. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dr. Schwarzfeger. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, Corona. And thank you, obviously, Danny. Uh, for again having been a perfect host. I always like that picture of the kind of comments hitting the either hot chocolate or the coffee or whatever it is. Um, but thank you again for everyone for participating. Thank you, Dr. Rummer. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank Steve Rummer. I actually want to steal um, and have one more question because we have three minutes and I've decided that I want to ask my own questions. Okay. We have none from the audience. Um, one of my big questions is like you said, you were talking about, you know, all of a sudden there was this big pushback and a year later it was just like nothing happened. Can you speak a little bit more to why you think that switch happened so quickly? Um, well, I think there was a futility uh, that settled in um, that um, with the with the non-Jewish Dutch citizens, at least um, that things weren't going to change. Um, the February strike was was brutally crushed by the Nazis. Uh, the professors and students uh, from Amsterdam and Leiden universities uh, were fired and imprisoned, uh, and the universities were closed. So they were very harsh repercussions for this kind of pushback. And I think after a year, people just um, settled into a new reality. Um, that this is the way it's going to be, and they can't change this. So I think when the uh, when the when the the German and the Dutch um, stepped up their exclusionary measures and started actually no kidding deporting people um, and emptying out Jewish communities, um, I think of most Dutch citizens just figured they they were powerless to stop it. I don't know. You know, I think that there clearly was a, a spread of anti-Semitism. I don't think everyone who worked, I mean, I, I mentioned several of these agencies that sort of sprung up after the occupation, um, right? The uh, the Veroff the Delling, the WA, uh, the Dutch Union. Um, I don't think that all of them began 1940 uh, thinking that they would ever persecute Jews, right? Or really, even really thinking about the difference between themselves and their Jewish neighbors. Um, but with that difference become, coming to the focus and coming to the forefront and the Germans saying, no, 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 they're not like you at all. They're totally the other, right? They're an alien race. They keep using this, this word. They're an alien race living among you. Um, and uh, people started to, you know, maybe buy that. But there, right. was, quite a, there was quite a bit of, a, a, of sheltering of Jews as well uh, after that point. Well, thank you for taking my last minute question and thank you everyone here today uh, for your time, talent and resources. Audience, thanks for joining us. Um, our team would appreciate any feedback you might have about the Comic Corner series. Please click through the survey link that I'm about to put in the Q&A chat and share your thoughts with us. Uh, you can also scan the QR code that's on your screen to sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Twitter or fill out that survey that I was talking about. Thank you everyone and have a great afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you again. Good seeing you. Thank you. Good, good seeing you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.